Hi, welcome back. This starts the third lecture in my Cognitive Psychology class, Psych 367 at the California State University at Northridge. And in this lecture, we're going to do just a sort of a brief introduction to the field of cognitive neuroscience. And uh, the goal of cognitive neuroscience is to understand how our brain gives rise to cognitive processes. That is, how does our brain give rise to memory and perception and language. Um, so cognitive neuroscience is the physiological basis of cognition. I want to start in sort of an unusual place, but it's, it's, it's a way to think about the role of patients in the development of the field of cognitive neuroscience and also of theories of the relationship between brain and behavior. Um, and this is a concept of dissociation. So dissociation is thought to occur when um, maybe as a result of a stroke or some sort of um, accident, one part of a person's brain is damaged and that damage causes them to lose some ability. But they have all the other abilities. I wanna start by talking to you about a patient named KC. And KC had damage to his brain as a result of a motorcycle accident and that caused him to lose autobiographical memories, memories about his own life. But he was able to retain memories of, of knowledge, of information. So an example, if I were KC, would be that I might forget um, my wedding, but remember um, the contents of a cognitive psychology page. So a cognitive psychology textbook. And KC was used to support the idea that different kinds of knowledge might be processed in different parts of the brain. Episodic memory, which we'll talk about later, but episodic memory is your memory for episodes in your life, based on the existence of patient KC, suggests that episodic memories might be processed differently in the brain than semantic or factual knowledge. Okay, let me tell you more about patient KC. Uh, he had a motorcycle accident, um, and this damaged a very deep part of his brain called the hippocampus. Actually, you have one on both sides of your brain. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so we say hippocampi, because you have two of them. And as a result of this damage to his hippocampus, he experienced amnesia, memory loss, but a particular kind of memory loss. His memory for general facts was fine, his memory for episodes in his life was lost. So um, he couldn't remember personal events like the death of his brother. Ouch. Um, so uh, it was based on um, uh, uh, extensive research that a, a very famous memory researcher by the name of Tulving did that we were able to conclude, that researchers were able to conclude that Look at that, it looks like different parts of the brain might be responsible for different aspects of memory. And I should make a side note here. In this class, we will be talking about patients throughout the semester. And sometimes you'll hear me refer to patients, almost all the time, refer to patients by letters. For example, patient KC. Um, that's done to protect the anonymity of the patient. So um, Dr. Tulving and his colleagues were able to publish research on Casey, who we now know was named Kent Cochran, um, without anybody knowing it was Kent Cochran. Now, after the patient dies, then we find out their name and more about the personal information. But so many of us get used to referring to somebody by their initials that we continue doing that. So that's why, that's why the initials. Anyway, this idea that different parts of the brain might underlie different aspects of memory has been upheld with subsequent brain imaging research. And I don't want you to memorize this, but I just want you to get a feel for this graph that different kinds of memory seem to rely, more or less, on different parts of the brain. Rarely, but every blue moon, 
researchers find something called a double dissociation. So with patient KC, there was a dissociation between memory for facts and memories for the episodes in his life, right? They seem to be separate. A double dissociation is said to occur when a researcher can find um, at least two patients that have opposite abilities. So imagine, um, we, know, we know Cochrane, KC, hung on to his knowledge, his memory of facts, but lost his memory for his individual life events. Imagine finding someone who had the opposite abilities. They could remember events from their lives, but not general facts. That would be, if you could find both people, sort of the mirror reverse of one another, that would be said, that would be a double dissociation. And double dissociations are important or have played an important role in the field of cognitive psychology because they suggest some independence of processing. Maybe not only separation, but maybe they actually rely on independent or completely separate processes. Um, a really good example of a double dissociation has to do with language, and I want to spend a little bit of time in this lecture talking about that. As you can see in the cartoon picture of the brain here, I'm pointing to two different parts of the brain, Broca's area and Wernicke's area. Broca's area, that's in part of the frontal lobes, is involved in language production. And we'll talk more about the discovery of Broca's area by who? Who discovered Broca's area? Yeah, Dr. Broca. Uh, language production seems to be separated, more or less, from language comprehension, which seems to take place in what's called Wernicke's area, because it was discovered by a researcher named Wernicke. Um, people who, because of a stroke, have damage to Broca's area, they have difficulty producing language but they understand language. So they can understand what's being asked of them, but they can't produce a response. Now this is the same uh, for deaf people and hearing people. So it doesn't, the modality of the language doesn't matter. You can have Broca's aphasia for verbal speech, just as you can have Broca's aphasia for sign language. Uh, if someone had a stroke or damage to a different part of their brain, to Wernicke's area, then that individual would have no trouble producing language. They could talk and talk and sign and sign, but they would have trouble understanding language. So what they said didn't make any sense. Um, I should step back here and say the word aphasia, which you'll hear a lot in this class, aphasia just means um, having some language difficulty, right? It could be either language production or language comprehension or both. So I want to take a break from talking here and show you some powerful video of an individual with Broca's aphasia and another individual with Wernicke's aphasia. The person with Broca's aphasia is a woman named Sarah Scott who had a stroke while she was a college student in class. And I'm going to show you some video from the first interview that she had after she had spent some time trying to recover from her Broca's aphasia. So hang on. Okay. <clears throat> so what's your name? Um, Scott. Oh, no. Sarah Scott. That's right. And how old are you? I can't. Try. I can't. You're 19. 19. Yeah. yeah. And what happened to you? Um, stroke. You had a stroke last year? Yes. And what happened? Can you remember what happened? Um, 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 school and English class. Okay. And I um book and I read it aloud. Um but I can't because strike. Okay, that was Sarah Scott. 
She has Broca's aphasia. So Sarah, when she was 19 years old, was standing up in class trying to read something, and she had a stroke that affected Broca's area, and as a result, she had trouble speaking, but you could see that she had no trouble understanding what was being asked of her, and you could tell that she knew what she wanted to say. So it was the production of language. She didn't have any trouble understanding language. Now we're going to see someone else. We're going to see uh, Byron Peterson, who has Wernicke's aphasia. And as a result of Wernicke's aphasia, uh, he has trouble understanding language. He will answer questions I'm sorry, he has trouble understanding language, but he has no trouble producing language. So he will talk, but what he says doesn't make a lot of sense. He will answer questions, but uh, he doesn't really understand the question or his answer to it. So let's watch. Hi, Byron, how are you? I'm happy, are you pretty? You look good. What are you doing today? We stayed with the water over here at the moment and talked with the people over them over there. They're diving for them at the moment. But they'll save in the moment. He'll have water very soon for him. With luck for him. So we're on a cruise and we're about to we get to We will see them right here and they'll save their hands right there for okay. them. And what were we just doing with the iPad? Uh, right at the moment, they don't show a darn thing. <laughs> <laughs> the iPad that we were doing. We, like here? I like my change for me and change hands for me. It was happy. I would talk with Donna sometimes. We're out with them. Other people are working with them. With them, I'm very happy with them. Good. This girl was really good and happy. And I play golf and hit other trees. We play out with the hands. We save a lot of hands on hold for people for us. Other hands. I don't know what you get, but I talk with a lot of hand for him. Sometime. Am I talk of any more to say? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, and I hope the world lasts for you. Interesting, no? Mr. Peterson's really an interesting case. He has language, he has words, and he can put those words together, but the meaning of the words gets lost. Now, aphasia isn't all or nothing. Um, in this class, we'll see a lot of boxes with arrows, and I'll talk about certain processes being gone or present, and that's really an oversimplification. Um, things are a lot more gray and nuanced than that. But I wanted to give you a sense of the difference between Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia. That, uh, that's the end of lecture 3.1, and I'll be right back in a minute with 3.2. Hang on.